So uh, we talk about Tesla on the show fairly frequently, I would say. It's that high-tech car company. You ever heard of it, Will? <laughs> you remember it? You remember it from previous episodes? Yeah. Uh, successful, popular, popularized the idea of electric vehicles. They, they've been in the background making models, creating models. Uh, apparently, the, the Model 3 sort of cannibalized the sales of the two other models that are currently available, the S and the X, those ones more expensive, the three sort of fitting into more people's uh, budget and and presumably what they're looking for in a, in a car. But apparently Elon Musk is most excited. Oh, there was also the Model Y, which they announced at a uh, the most recent event. But they got another event coming up, Will. And apparently in this event, they're going to unveil the, the Tesla project that Elon Musk is most excited for. Mm. And this event is set to take place in November. And it's set to address a very popular part of the market, Will, which is the pickup truck part of the market. A lot of people don't realize how popular pickup trucks are, especially if you're watching the show from Europe or somewhere other than North America. Number one selling vehicle, United States, Ford F-150. Did you know that, Will? Uh, no. It's a crazy but successful. I'm not surprised. It's a crazy I successful vehicle. And it's one of the reasons that the North American automakers are mostly out of sedans now because they're like, you know, our trucks are doing so well. We're going to sell more trucks. People are going to buy trucks. People are hauling things around. You drive the truck every so often, Will. Yeah, once in a while. You can sit behind the wheel of a truck. It's fun. Yeah, you're up above the road there. It's like driving a boat. There you go. <laughs> so, now obviously, the F-150, a traditional pickup, you know Elon's not going to do it like that when he comes with the electric pickup. Mm-hmm. Now, he used some very specific words to describe this upcoming pickup truck that's going to be launched at this event in November. And he used some words that were music to my ears, Will he do? What's that? He said it's going to look Blade Runner esque. Oh. You ever heard me say Blade Runner before, Will? Here and there. You ever you ever heard me say Star Trek, Star Wars, Stargate? Yes. SG One. Yeah. Every day. I never watched that show, but I was here. You know the commercials. Yeah. SG One. It's always like a portal. Doesn't that always happen where? The TV show, then it happened with Law and Order. They you have the TV or the TV show, the movie with the straight name, and then as you go down the path, it has some success. You get into the SG ones, or in the case of Law and Order, you get into the Special Investigations. That's the type of thing Vin watch on TV. <laughs> special, <laughs> what is it? Special Unit. You go down the anyway. What does the SG-1 stand for? Who knows? Somebody knows. They're going to let us know in the comments. We're going to we're gonna have to look it up. We're going to have to look it up. Well, anyhow, Blade Runner. That's the real future uh, Ridley Scott, the original one. I actually haven't seen the new one. Original one, future prediction is kind of, uh, it's a fun future. It's not just strictly minimal, like everything has vanished. There's cogs and wheels and buttons and lights and neon it's that it's that Japan, it's that Neo future. Mm-hmm. Neo Tokyo. Yeah, Will's a big Tokyo guy. Yeah. It's great. See? Told you. You should go. Maybe I will. Yeah. Maybe I will. Uh so Elon goes so far to say that this cyberpunk blade runner pickup truck is going to be too futuristic for some people. That's what he says. And so we've got these renders that have just emerged alongside some fresh comments. And I don't know if you knew this, Will, but uh, Elon is friends with Joe Rogan from the mm-hmm. podcast. He, he's been, he went on there famously. Maybe, yeah. is that the most famous, uh, is that the most popular podcast of all time? I think it has like 13 million views. Elon goes on the Rogan podcast, has himself a time. Right, turns into a meme. <laughs> Does he ever? Turns into a bit of a meme, and uh, and they become friends. And so apparently, on a recent episode of 
Joe's podcast, he referenced a conversation with Elon in which he asked him about this upcoming pickup based on these renders, the renders you were just showcasing there, Will, that kind of Tonka truck looking thing. And Elon responded to the text saying, it's going to look even more Blade Runner than that. Wow. These are impressive. It's going to look even more Blade Runner than that. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm excited. So this is on the back of a little preview that they gave at the Model Y event. So if you head over to the article, Elon Musk releases teaser image of Tesla's cyberpunk electric pickup truck. Teaser of cyberpunk electric pickup truck. They showed the most vague image ever at the Model Y event. That's the image. <laughs> Jack's looking at it. Will's looking at it. What am I looking at? Is it the front? Is it the back? People have been debating what this image is since it was unveiled. And then you got the comments developing from Elon saying, yeah, it's going to be too futuristic for some. And all of a sudden... Your imagination runs wild. Yeah. Someone got to brighten up the contrast in this uh, image. What do you think, Will? Is that the front or the back of the vehicle? Well, I'm looking at the logo here. It's uh, It does look like the front. The front. You, th you think that's the front. Okay. So for those of you that are just listening, to, to just on the audio version of this show, we have this really squ like squared off a rectangular front. If it's the front, this rectangular shape, which may maybe the front, maybe the back of the truck, that looks nothing like a truck. No. It looks incredibly oversimplified. There's no windshield. There's no wheel. Exactly. You're missing all the other components. It's just a raw shape. And uh, there's lights on the angled side of it, the corners. No, it's, it's Elon himself who keeps making the reference to Blade Runner. He even tweeted out shortly after this leak, Blade Runner played after... Model Y webcast cut, and then a minute in, they flashed that teaser pic of the cyberpunk truck, which is just like this very slim image. Okay, so things are getting exciting. Things are very interesting. And some, Will, attempted to take that image right there and build renders based around it. So not just strictly imaginary, like the last image that you were showcasing there of the Blade Runner-ish truck. And so if you head over to InsideEVs.com, <laughs> InsideEVs.com, and look for, oh, I think you got it right there. This yeah, right click click on that. Try that one. No, 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 not that one, not that one. You need uh, new Tesla truck render features Ram box. Maybe, maybe type, yeah, okay, here we go. You'll get it. You got this under control. <laughs> so, so somebody went really far uh, with the, they took the, the original image that was flashed at the event. They took it very literally and their render uh, comes off quite comedically. Uh, it looks like a, how was that remind you? Is that a duck? Does that make you think of a duck? <laughs> it just looked, the back of it looks like a normal pickup truck. Yeah, but explain <laughs> the front of it, Will. Uh, I mean, I guess it looks kind of like a duck. I don't know, man. This is, uh, <laughs> it's just like this giant <laughs> column. Here. Jack, if it barks like a duck, it's probably a duck. It looks terrible. Obviously, it's not going to look like this, but maybe it's not as far as you think it is. This is just a render. Imagine if it turned out a bit more sleek and the windshield, because, you know, Tesla has been trying this thing with this all glass so that when you're in it, it feels very futuristic. Mm -hmm. Maybe the proportions are off here, but, but maybe we just need to look a little deeper into this render. <laughs> no, it's going to look better than that. Anyhow... There's been a couple different approaches to, to how to potentially render this thing. But in on a more serious note, this is a really important, big launch for Tesla because, as I mentioned, Will, it's a very popular segment of the market. 
It's a part of the market that's completely out of the electric zone for the time being. It's just not an option. Mm. It's a part of the market that purchases a lot of gasoline mm -hmm. currently because yeah. those things have big engines, big tanks. They've become more fuel efficient recently, but still they're, they're big, heavy vehicles. They require a lot of torque, which electric motors are really great at. Yeah. And you need that torque in those bigger vehicles. You need to haul. A lot of people like to have to haul things, uh, tra uh, trailering. They want to put the boat on the back. It'll be really interesting to see what Tesla's play is with the electric pickup truck. And also, if your traditional pickup truck buyer is interested in this super futuristic design, because those two things don't quite match up. Mm -hmm. it, it, trucks have it, trucks kind of have a traditional appearance. Yeah, they change a little bit here and there, and they become more modern, but the shapes are, are kind of similar to what they've been. And so if it's as radical as some of these renders, are people ready for that? I don't know. Elon doesn't seem to care. He decided to go full cyberpunk. He decided to go uh, full Blade Runner. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate that regardless. So you might have to put my name on the list. And we'll see what happens in November. Nonetheless, uh, I'm sure, based on what's been said, based on what he's texting Joe, Elon's texting Joe at this point, I'm pretty convinced that things going to be super futuristic. Mm -hmm. And you know me. I'm always looking for super yeah. futuristic. Yeah. Uh, you heard about the OnePlus 7T Pro, Will? Yeah. Yeah, they had an event. Know. Big event. Where was it? In Europe? I don't know. It wasn't nearby. Somewhere in Europe. It was somewhere in Europe. And it's not coming to the U.S. So the, the, that's, I mean, that was my immediate takeaway. It's not coming to North America. OnePlus 7T Pro. Of course, recently we did the unboxing video OnePlus 7T and started to question or wonder about the future of the non-T version of the 7 Pro, the one I mean, the one that was making all the waves with the pop-up camera and so forth. Then the 7T comes along, and you, you hear the story of T-Mobile essentially getting rid of the 7 Pro to replace it with the cheaper standard 7T. And everything's getting all confusing now because now they got this event in Europe for the 7T Pro, which is for markets other than North America where they're really going to be pushing the 7T. So they ha seem to have this very uh, specific strategy depending on market in relationship to these launches. It's also a lot of phones, Will. Mm -hmm. What we're talking about in this day and age, uh, in, in just what seems like a span of a few months, 7 Pro, 7T, 7T Pro. It's yeah, so much to choose I'm from. I'm trying to look for the, the actual site. I can't even find it. Yeah, you can't get there. Like for the launch. No, you can't get there, Will. <laughs> I'll just look at the specs. Guy like you, you ran out of steam. One too many websites. Yeah. It's over for you. Anyhow, so 7T Pro, they have an event. It's a, it's a tiny spec bump on the 7 Pro for the most part. There's some new color options. There's a McLaren version, which I'll talk more about in a moment. But mostly, this is a tiny spec bump on the 7 Pro for very specific markets. So what does that spec bump look like? You move to the Snapdragon 855 Plus from the standard 855. Mm -hmm. According to Engadget, that's 15% faster GPU performance than the stock 855. So 15% performance improvement, okay. Nothing too major there. Then the next piece is the fact that it's going to include the 30T warp charge power adapter. Now, we saw that power adapter with the standard 7T. Correct. Remember that? Yep. So this is a, is a crazy fast charger capable of delivering 68% charge in 30 minutes to the new 7T Pro. But again, you want to save a few bucks on the standard 7 version. If it's available in your market, you're still you're getting that anyhow. So now you're starting to wonder, okay, how does this one... I, I get it. It's a slight improvement. It charges faster than the 7 Pro, the T Pro, and it's got uh, a slightly faster uh, chip in it. But beyond that, it's it's pretty much the same device again. 12 gigs of RAM? Well, 12 gigs of RAM is in the McLaren version. I see. Uh, out the gate, though you can probably spec the standard version if you want to pay a few more bucks, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, because the standard version is 8 gigs of RAM, 256, yeah. right? 
and then the, and then you can get the 256 12 gig RAM standard version or the 12 gig RAM 256 McLaren edition. And the McLaren edition obviously has its own fancy look to it. As we've seen in the past, you get the little orange accents mm -hmm. around the edge there. And it's just a, it's, it's a little special touch to it. Now, in the past, the McLaren edition also charged faster than the other versions, sort of to as an homage to the speed associated with the McLaren brand. Now, everybody's getting the 30T warp charge. So basically what you end up with here is, is your only difference being uh, uh, this, this slight improvement to performance and this slightly faster charging. Now, when you start to talk about, and the appearance, if you go for the McLaren version, if you start to do the comparison of the 7T to the 7T Pro, this is all very difficult to keep it together. If you do the, that particular comparison, then it's just a slightly better screen resolution and the pop-up camera because that right. one's got the faster charging and has got the updated chip. And that one's cheaper at $599. So I don't know what you're looking at now. If you want to step up, the McLaren edition is going to be 800 pounds in Great Britain. So that's not cheap. And the standard 7T Pro is going to be 700 pounds in Britain. And Will's busy doing the conversion. So it's, 800 pounds is... Uh, a thousand almost, bucks. Almost a thousand. Yeah, at the current... But you know how this goes, Will. It doesn't always map 100... No. If they were playing in this market, right. they may adjust that pricing somewhat. But, but it's definitely more than the standard 7T. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to be, for a lot of buyers, a tough justification. I think a lot of people are going to be interested in the 7T standard at 599 start price going on sale October 18th. And I think, presumably, complete speculation here, that's probably why they've been so specific about markets. It's probably why they're going to put the focus on the 7T here in North America, where it might be tougher for some of these brands, maybe T-Mobile, for example, to stock these multiple versions. Also, it, it might they may feel that the 7T is going to cannibalize the purchase of the Pro version with the higher profit margin, or they might feel it's just that's the model that delivers the most value. That's the model they won't really want to focus on from a marketing perspective. There's so many potential reasons for this, but it's hard to call the 7T Pro a new a new phone. And it's and, and it, I can see it being confusing to buyers as to why these things are launching at all these various points in time mm -hmm. and all these various events. It'd be one thing, Will, if you had a singular event and you had a 7T and a 7T Pro launch at the same time. And, right. and you just, okay, I get it. I'm supposed to pick whichever one is has the yep. feature set that I'm looking for. But their strategy is so much different. And I think I can see a reason for it. You get yourself back in the press cycle over and over again. Mm -hmm. People talking about it. Oh, there's a new OnePlus phone. Instead of blowing it all on one deal. Right, like a slow trickle. Yeah, it's a trickle effect. Yeah. Makes it seem like you got stuff cooking mm -hmm. in... in uh, Sitting there in the in the what? Well, in the stove. In the hopper. In the hopper. What's a hopper? I don't know. People say that though. They say. Is it the oven? They say they keep it in the hopper. How does a hopper work? I don't know. Is that the furnace? Furnace. I don't know. <laughs> no, people say that. I got it in the hopper. Do they? I, maybe I just made it up. In the hopper. There you go. Phrase American English. If you put something in the hopper, you keep it so it can be used later. Mm. See that, Will? But what is a hopper? No, don't doubt me, Will. I felt your negative, uh, I felt your judgment. Um, You're saying, no, nah, Lou went out, Lou's out to lunch on this one. I yeah. guess it's just a hopper. You're like, there is it no is. hopper. Yeah. You were feeling that way for a minute. Let's, let's look at images then. <laughs> That's dangerous. You can't just start looking at images it's on the show. That could lead you anywhere. Anyway, yeah, oven. I don't know why Why you said oven. What are you going to do in the oven? It's going to cook. Oh, it's going to cook, cook longer. Yeah, cook. Cook, Bake a little uh, longer. Yeah. Keep it warm. Mm -hmm. uh, a li little golden brown on the a outside. A little base, yeah. Crunchy on the outside, soft on the inside. Yeah. Will he do, ladies and gentlemen? Chocolate chip cookie. Mm -hmm. You eat those? Yeah, they're great. When's the last time you had one? Uh... Probably a couple months ago, to be honest. Wow, that's a rough life you're living there. I know. People, uh, Will needs a chocolate chip cookie, right? He needs <laughs> help awesome. right? to help him out. Uh, Rwanda launches its first made in Africa smartphones. Oh, you didn't, you didn't think, you never heard about that, Will. I got you on that one. 
You didn't think about that. Oh. All the talk, trade talks, trade tension, Chinese made smartphones, Vietnamese made smartphones, uh, Indian made smartphones. How about the very first smartphone made entirely in Africa? Entirely, the founder of this company wants to make it clear that there's over a thousand parts. They're manufacturing the boards. They're not assembling. Oh. They're manufacturing the motherboards there. And there's other places uh, beyond Rwanda, South Africa, Egypt, and others that where assembly takes place. But this is the first fully made in Africa smartphone. And the aim here is to bring, potentially bring more uh, African users, Rwandan users, into the smartphone marketplace. The non-smartphone, dumb phone marketplace is still fairly large there. In Rwanda, according to Reuters, uh, apparently only 15% of the population are using smartphones right now. And the pitch here from this company, Marafone, is, hey, if you're going to buy your first smartphone, you should support local. You should support a Rwandan company in doing so. Mm -hmm. They're launching two models, the Mara X and Mara Z. They're going to run Android, of course. The price is listed in Rwandan francs, but they translate, or sorry, they uh, convert to 190 bucks or 130 bucks. So budget models available in different colors. It looks like a fairly stock Android experience mm -hmm. based on a website as well. They're going to compete with the likes of Samsung, but Samsung is in there selling selling uh, smartphones starting at 54 bucks in Rwanda. That's kind of incredible. So there's going to be a bit of a premium if you want to support local, as is sometimes the case. Uh, we are actually the first who are doing manufacturing. We are making the motherboards. We are making the subboards during the entire process. There are over 1,000 pieces per phone. They put 50 million bucks into a plant capable of making 10,000 phones per day. So, uh, you know, this is kind of in, in the same in the same frame as what we've been talking about with the incentivization in India to bring manufacturing local or at least assembly portion of the manufacturing process local. There are benefits to the region that happen when the entire industry comes instead of just the finished product. Mm -hmm. there's, there's value added for the individuals and the local economy. And all of a sudden you people have uh, have jobs. And, and they're able to uh, interact with the economy in a more uh, dynamic way, a more dynamic fashion. So it's positive. Uh, you know, what, what can you say? I, I'll probably never get my hands on these. Maybe they'll send me one. I'm curious. Yeah, I'll hit them up. Yeah, hit them up. I don't know. I'm curious. The world's first made-in-Africa smartphone. You know 1.3 billion people, Will. Really? We spend a lot of time trying to forecast the future of the smartphone marketplace through the lens of the, the biggest consumers, that, that, that the, the biggest smartphone markets that exist right now, but potential. 1.3 billion people in Africa, and using Rwanda as an example, 15% with smartphones. How many new people have the potential to come online? That's a fresh marketplace. Mm -hmm. That's, a, that's the potential to be a huge marketplace. And pr presumably, it's going to be Android, obviously. Yeah. If this is any indication. And, and, and therefore, it's a lot of people getting access to the web, a lot of people getting access to Google services. It would be interesting to see how it all plays out. Like the whole infrastructure. Could the change. whole thing. Yeah. The package deal. So Africa could be the next India in terms of smartphones. Maybe not immediately, maybe not tomorrow, but potentially. There's apparently a, an economic component as well. Uh, Mara Group hopes to profit from the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, a pact aimed at forming a 55-nation trade bloc to boost sales across Africa. So that's, it's been difficult, I guess, up until now to have trade take place over the various borders that exist in Africa. Mm -hmm. And this will unite the 1.3 billion people from a trade perspective and create a predicted 3.4 trillion 
dollar economic block. So big things, man. Mm. I'm just keeping you in the loop, Will. No, I think it's great. You know, there is like a sense of pride when something from your own country is made and you actually buy it. I'm just trying to keep you up to date, Willie Do. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's good. Thank I'm just you. trying to keep you on your toes. I appreciate it. I see you over there. You're watching YouTube. I don't know what you're looking at. Yeah. You know, some you know. some new trend. Yeah. All of a sudden, uh, some guy's cooking steak. He's got the Wagyu beef. That's what you're watching. KSI, Logan Paul, boxing. You're not watching that, are you? No. <laughs> no, you got the guy in the grill with the square block looking Wagyu beef. Yeah, shout out to Aiden Films. Okay, there you go. You shout the guy yeah. out at least. Yeah. He flips it over, it sizzles so gently. Well, he doesn't do it. Well, he's 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 Japanese gonna eat it. Master does. He's gonna eat it. Yes. So that's rude then. <laughs> uh no, that's Willie delicious. Do enjoys it. He's into a lot of stuff, but I got to keep him in the loop with the important I know, stuff. Otherwise, gotta, he gets carried away. He goes, who knows where he goes. Yeah, he gets carried rabbit away. Rabbit holes. Carried away. You ever heard of DXO, Mark, Will? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're the guys that are doing the, the camera testing. Yep. They give you that score. They uh, always in the press. At, at, at so many different smartphone events. Look at our DXO, Mark. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's always some... Some new phone, breaking the records. And it was funny when it first crossed over the 100-point threshold. People thought it was going to end. They thought 100 was perfect. Like, every phone's going to be perfect. No, the score just kept going. Uh, they're getting into audio now, not just cameras. So oh, okay. yeah, so for, for the longest time, they were just rating cameras, selfies, and pr providing this technical score for how they uh, perceived performance through their various tools, and they, get, they spit out a number for camera performance for various phones, and they were stacked up against each other. People found this to be a resource. Mm -hmm. Now they're getting into the audio game. As you know, on Unbox Therapy, we're, we're, we're constantly testing audio performance of phones and laptops, and it's recently we kind of decided it's tough to even say what sounds good because it's so subjective what a person might perceive as sounding good. And also, a, a person has kind of an inability to hear what you're hearing because they're getting the sound through this from the speaker, through your microphone. It's, it's compressed. It's it, all the, that YouTube. Yeah. And, now, I'm not saying I'm going to stop doing it. It might be worth something to someone to hear that performance, especially in relationship to other stuff you've heard on the channel. But it's just a diff difficult thing to put a number on, to put a score on, and to say, for sure, one is better than the other when a lot of it comes down to what you're looking for. It, might it be more clarity uh, for dialogue? Might it be more bass performance and so forth? Well, they came up with a, a regimen similar to, what, to the way they're looking at cameras in order to evaluate audio performance across a number of categories, including timber, dynamics, spatial, volume, artifacts, and recording. So they did not not they they didn't just take into account audio performance when you're watching a video for example but also what about the microphones when you're recording a video and then the playback from that how about background noise how about artifacts like clipping when you're listening back what about overall volume uh, what about dynamics attack bass precision punch volume dependency will do you see this they yes. went deep on it. Mm -hmm. They went deep. I think a lot of people might appreciate. They had to come up with a system that leveraged uh, both obvious measurements. You can measure volume, for example. You can get sound meters and so forth. But it also utilized a, a certain degree of human analysis, too. There's some uh, various engineers and things like this involved in the process to a certain degree. There's no way around it. Uh, so anyhow, they started out with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. They started out with seven smartphones for their initial run of DxO Mark Audio. And the top of the list is occupied by the Huawei Mate 20X. And apparently, it was able to achieve that high score one point better than the iPhone XS Max because of its stereo microphones for recording. 
Because what DxO Mark does is they take, they compile all of this data in these various categories to come up with this eventual number, which is the overall figure. And apparently the Mate series had a huge advantage in that department, pushing it above the iPhone XS Max. Now, the other interesting thing you're going to see on this performance chart is the fact that the iPhone XS Max actually beats the iPhone 11 Pro Max by three points. So the previous version flagship big iPhone surprisingly outperforms the new one from an audio perspective. Maybe because they had to make some extra space for that new camera situation and it had some sort of impact on audio. Now, it's important to note it's number two and number three out of the ones that they right. tested. So it's still pretty good. But that's one of the advantages, one of the unspoken advantages of the bigger phones is that they typically have substantially better audio performance for watching videos and, and so on because you can get bigger units in there right. and, and so forth. Uh, the rest of the list beyond the 11 Pro Max, Samsung Galaxy Note 10 Plus scores a 66. Samsung Galaxy S10 Plus 65, Honor 20 Pro 53, and Sony Xperia 145. So that's just the immediate list for now. But of course, as they've done in, in the camera department, they're going to be expanding this list that may have your smartphone in it very soon. And I could see it being a resource that people like myself use to kind of glance at and say, okay, what are we working with? Most of this I kind of already knew. We, we got the sound meter out at one point in time to figure this out. And it's fairly obvious to your ears, but it depends. You need to know what you're listening for. And so to have... An analysis like this, in the type of environment they were able to create, I mean, you can go and look online. They got all the various sound material. They created a chamber. They've got high-end audio equipment and so forth in order to run this analysis. It's cool that they're going to be creating this, uh, what would you call it, Well, They're creating a, a repository, no, a directory. Yeah. Directory of smartphone audio performance to go with their directory of smartphone camera performance. So go check it out if you like and keep an eye out for your device in the future. Uh, you know, Apple is finally going to fix the MacBook Pro keyboard design once and for all, according to BGR.com. I mean, I have a, I have a long standing history with the, uh, the MacBook keyboards. We talked about it so much. It's like, I don't even know. It's not, it's not necessary to go incredibly deep into it. Let's do the short version. Apple uh, wanted to create this incredibly thin and light laptop. Huge emphasis on thinness, materials. And it led them towards this uh, key design called butterfly, butterfly key switches, key switch design, butterfly key switches, moving away from the traditional scissor style. And a lot of people, it's important to know, like that design. Will is a big fan of that design, in fact. Yeah, I love the clickiness. He just loves the clickiness. But it's had a substantial number of issues. As you can see outlined in the video yeah. Will's showcasing, that was like a four-day-old MacBook Air, which was having all kinds of issues with right. the key presses and just, just spitting out whatever letters, whatever letters it wanted, essentially, regardless of where you were clicking. So you do a little bit more research, you find out that the issue is fairly widespread, so widespread that Apple is re releasing their current models of laptops alongside a pre-existing recall for if yours fails or an extended repair program. So Apple knows and, and has basically apologized and admits that, they're, that that key switch design is, is uh, flawed, so much so that they're going to move away from it. And apparently that switch over, switch over, yes. is going to take place sooner than expected. Uh, we got our, our, our favorite constantly involved, constantly in the press, Ming-Chi Ming Kuo. Huh. He says in a fresh investor note that Apple plans to migrate 
the entirety of its MacBook line to the scissor mechanism keyboard in 2020. And this is interesting because the original rumor was that they, they, they may stick to it and, and experiment with a new design on an upcoming 16-inch OLED model specifically. And maybe the older models would have hung back. But this new information seems to indicate that every single model will switch over, which would make sense to me considering not just my own personal experience, but the various forms I've been in online. And, and, and it appears to be a fairly widespread issue that people's butterfly key switch keyboards are having issues. Now, the other thing that happens when you switch over to a more traditional key switch is you're going to get more travel back. Now, you may not like that, Will, because you're super comfortable with your butterfly key switches currently. But, but me, I like a little bit of key travel, as I've referenced many times on the channel. So we may see a little bit of key travel back in MacBooks just by nature of the fact that they move away from this unique uh, key switch design. Now, another interesting piece to this particular story, uh, apparently, it, the speculation is that Johnny Ive may have been one of the driving forces behind this butterfly key switch, aiming to get the thing as thin as possible. Apparently, he was a stickler for thinness. Big fan of the thinness in gadgets yeah. in general, uh, which there's something to that, right? It's not completely pointless to make things thin. It's just, mm -hmm. I think for most buyers, it's to a point, at which point you start looking for utility you, you just want that that balance. Yeah. Utility, thinness, design, looks, form, function, both, ideally. So the speculation here is now that he has exited the company, that finally they can get rid of the butterfly. Like, like may, well, like, may, like, somehow maybe he was one of the reasons that they yeah. were hanging on to it for so long. It's speculation. I'm right. not saying that. Johnny, if it's not true, I, I believe you. If it's not true, I believe you. But that's the speculation didn't want to give up on on it and it because it is it's curious that they went on with the same design for as long as yeah. they did even after admitting and apologizing saying yeah there's an issue with these keyboards the, the way they're made and we're going to keep making them very very bizarre but nonetheless positive news who knows there may be a macbook in my future now because that's kind of been the apprehension right was the keyboard if they go to a if they put together a keyboard, anything like this, all like of a sudden I'm checking pad. that out. The ThinkPad. Yeah, this one right here, I'm checking that out. E or not, it doesn't have to be like this. I actually like the Surface laptop keyboard as well, which is a th it's even thinner than this one, mm -hmm. but it has some travel to it. Mm. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out, but it seems I'm fairly confident based on the information that's out there that we have witnessed the death of the butterfly key switch, Will. So I don't know if you're going to be upset about that, but it just seems like the way it has to go. Because people are getting crumbs in there. Yes. There's a, particles get in there. People live with their stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you can't... The keyboard is too important as far as utility is concerned right. to potentially be out of commission for any extended period of time. It's a very important component on your laptop. No, I agree. I'm optimistic about it. I kind of want to see the next ger generation of design. There it is. Yeah. Uh, Google is teasing new assistant celebrity voice. Do do well. Do you want a celebrity to be your Google assistant voice? Depends who. You might consider. Yeah. Uh, isn't it too important <laughs> when you're when you're there? Uh, navigate to are you ready for a are you trusting a celebrity i guess it would have to be subtle who who's your celebrity assistant voice that you would go with hmm. who do you want now to you give me you directions I, I don't know who do you i know just what kind of is it is there an accent like a, involved yeah kind of like a jarvis from iron man okay like a british accent okay but that's not really so, a celebrity is it though like uh Gosh. Jack's got one. I know he's got one on deck. Jack Nicole wants Nicole Kidman. Kidman. That's his celebrity choice for assistant. <laughs> Alfred from uh, Batman. Oh, uh, what's the actor's name? You got to say the actor's name. 
Kane. Michael Kane. Michael Kane, yes. Michael Kane. He's very distinct. What about David Attenborough? Yes, I was think just thinking that too. No, I'm the one that said that. <laughs> he might actually be a good option. Yeah. Or Morgan Freeman. Mm -hmm. Anyway, these are the ones that always get talked about. There's some of those voices those that are out there that are uh, iconic. Iconic yes. voices. So Google, there's a video that leaked. Uh, Google was promoting a video on Instagram. And it leaked with their new assistant voice. They had played around with John Legend. <laughs> played yeah. around. They... they uh, they identified him as cameo voice, I believe, at one of their events. I don't know if you recall that. It was a while back now. I think it was in, yeah, it was at I.O., Google I.O. Anyhow, people are speculating who this new voice is. So go ahead and play it, and let's see if uh, it rings a bell to any of us. And we can figure out who that is. Now I just sound extra fly. <laughs> All right, that's your new celebrity assistant. You want to play it one more time, Will? Yeah, that's what that's what people are saying. Now, I apologize. I'm not familiar with Tiffany Haddish. Uh, she's a an actress. I, I assume she's an actress, a comedian, a, a comedian and actress. Okay, so people are speculating it's Tiffany Haddish. There's some other, uh, according to Nine to Five Google. There's some other speculation. It could be Issa Ray. Issa Ray. So there's some guesses that are out there. This comes on the back of a, a sort of potential bidding war for celebrity voices. This, this one flew under the radar for me, but last month, Amazon added a paid Samuel Jackson voice for Alexa and Echo. Oh. Did you know that? No. How, how would you feel about Sam, Sam Jackson? He's like yelling at me. Yeah, he's yelling at you. Swearing. It might be just what you need in your life. Get moving. Yeah. You're late for your appointment, Sam Jackson. Yeah. So, I think Tarantino is the only one that gets to call him Sam Jackson. By the way, oh really? I don't. I'm. I don't think I'm allowed. I think I have to call him Samuel. <laughs> if and L, I got to call him Samuel L. Jackson. That's the full. But Tarantino gets to call him Sam Jackson. Uh, yeah, you guys, let me know down in the comments. Google is apparently committed to it. So you guys, let me know in the comments who your celebrity assistant voice would be. I'm curious to check that out. According to Sundar Pichai, celebrity voices have been a top request for assistant, and it fits into the company's goal to get accents, languages, and dialects right globally. So they're committed to it. It's going to happen. You're going to see more options emerging, and you're going to have your very own pick. Jack's got Nicole Kidman on deck. Willie Do has Michael Caine. Who knows who it's going to be? It's going to be exciting, nonetheless. Uh... We have exciting news in the world of flying cars. Don't give up on flying cars, Will. It's not over yet. There's hope. Yeah, it's going to happen. According to Porsche and Boeing, they got a new partnership aiming to develop premium electric flying cars. How crazy is that? Those are big players. Mm -hmm. Those aren't jokers. They're invested. They're, 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 they're a big deal. They're, they're champions, titans of industry. Now, they want to do an electric vehicle takeoff and landing, what's called an EVTOL, which is the key to electric flying cars. You can't have a runway, Will. No one's got space for a runway. You got to take off straight up. Mm -hmm. uh, straight up and be able to land straight down. The Jetsons, Will. I'm guessing this is like a personal aircraft. You ever see the Jetsons, Will? Yes. No, you didn't. Well, they were flying in space. Come on. Did you ever see the Jetsons? No, they're just above. That. They're not as far into space as you think. Uh, no, it's a key. They're not that far. They're just above the Earth's atmosphere, I think. I see. Because it's, a, And I think it was... The Earth was still happening, I think, as well in the Jetsons. I read about this recently. It's just you could go live... See, see where the clouds are there, Will? Mm-hmm. So, you know, I see. I'm telling you, you don't see, you don't know sometimes, Will. I gotta, you're, you're watching the Wagyu steak going on. <laughs> yeah, I don't watch the. No, I gotta, sure. I just gotta keep you in the loop. How old is this? Anyway, so they, pro I mean, they were promising flying cars back in 1962, mm -hmm. right? 
The yeah. Jetsons, 1962, they're making those promises. That's a big promise to make. That long, what, 50 years ago, 60 years ago almost, people uh, people didn't get close. It didn't happen. And then you saw these weird, every single flying car to this point has been this weird fold-up airplane-looking thing that do, just doesn't have that futuristic vibe to it. But if you have players like Porsche and Boeing getting involved, maybe there's something to it. Maybe it's not over. That's the one. I remember seeing that one there with the car doors. I mean, it's just, it's not going to happen, obviously. No, the one down to the left there, that's a real, that's a real one on the New York Times article there. That's a real thing that happened, but you still need it. I mean, that's just, that's obviously not it. It's cool, but it's obviously not it. Yeah. This new partnership will explore what a premium offering might look like in the era of urban air mobility, including working together on the aircraft design as well as figuring out what the potential market for a premium air service would look like. So apparently companies like Uber will are already moving into uh, the, the helicopter space within urban centers. Mm. Uh, you want the express route to the airport, you pick up the Uber chopper. I remember when they were showcasing that, they were doing chopper rides at one of the CESs that we were at. Oh, really? And you could... If you opened your Uber app, Uber Chopper was on there. And it was just a promotional thing for the time being during CES in Vegas. But it turns out they, they went on to launch an actual helicopter service, a premium helicopter. It's not cheap to get on a helicopter. Well, no. You want to skip the traffic on the way to the airport? You better pay. Mm -hmm. you, you better bring your wallet, Willie Duke. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, guy like you, gridlock. Yes. Yeah, honking your horn ain't going to do much when you're late for that flight because you're on your way back to Tokyo, remember? Yeah. A, yeah. Chop, a chopper is loud. Really, really loud. <laughs> you want to order, like everyone orders like a Uber chopper for their personal travel. It's, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's pretty loud for the neighbors. That's all I can say. <laughs> Willie do, ladies and gentlemen. Just saying. Willie do. Ladies and gentlemen, he just discussed, he just informed us that choppers are loud. Yes. In case, <laughs> in case. I mean, imagine a chopper pulling up to your house. No, I mean, it's not going to, the chopper as it is right now. Is gonna, drive, and, and then you still got to drive to like the platform where the chopper's at. I don't know. I'm just saying it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's loud. <laughs> Willie do. I don't think you want a chopper. Though, If you look at the render here, you, it's going to be some futuristic thing like that. And you know if it's electric, it's already quieter to begin with. Yeah. So I don't think they're aiming at a chopper. I'm just trying to say companies like Uber are looking into the idea of urban air travel because of how congested things are. Yes, it's ambitious, and that's, it's, a, it's great. That's just what you have right now is choppers, but yeah. it could be an indication of a potential marketplace not necessarily for owning your own flying car, but instead for urban transport. In other words, it could be a premium type of service in the early stages in order to compensate for the cost of developing the vehicles. Not Who's going to be able to afford one of these things? You're going to have to pay it off over time, just like the chopper business. It would have to run in a similar fashion, something like that. So do you think Uber could partner up with uh, there you go. Boeing and Porsche? Now we're talking. Now we're talking because, like you said, the chopper is not really an ideal short air trip situation for a lot of circumstances. It works. Uh, obviously, it's the best that exists right now. Mm -hmm. But now you have some big players imagining a potentially different future and a potentially different method of urban air transform transform transportation. Transformation. Mm -hmm. A Could transformation of transportation. There you go. We should just end it right there. No, I got one more. All right. Did you know that smartphone slouching is more serious than it sounds? As Jack slouches over his smartphone right now? Are they growing horns in the back of no, the horn apparent the horn thing was overblown, but <laughs> the 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 slouching, it's really affecting you, Will. It's affecting your sleep. You're getting heartburn. Uh, 
Yeah. Your, your poor posture is leading to issues in your cervical spine. I feel it. Yeah. Yeah. Look at Jack. He's trying to fix his posture right now. No, Jack. You're slouching. Don't you dare pretend. I never saw you sit like that in my life. Don't <laughs> it's pretend. Like 90 degrees. Yeah, don't pretend. So apparently the, the average person's on their smartphone 3.5 hours per day. Obviously, that's double for you two. And that is terrible for your body. Your body's not trying to be cranked up like that. Three people don't realize time passes like ah, it just happened to me. Mm -hmm. People they don't realize the health risks that spring from poor posture while using mobile devices don't concern many Americans. A new survey finds, but maybe it should. Could lead to chronic pain in the back, neck and knees, circulation problems, heartburn, digestive problems. Who knows what it's con contributing I got all to. of that. Yeah, you got it all. So the average American, 3.5 hours on their smartphone, looking down or slouching for most of that time. There's also eye strain involved, carpal tunnel. Uh, the, this matters because your head is really heavy, Will. Did you know that? Yeah. Your head's really heavy. And for every little bit that you move it forward, there's a multiplier effect of how much weight that's applying to your to your spine. That's crazy. 10 to 11 pounds, your head. Mm -hmm. You pick up a 10-pound weight, that's significant. Mm -hmm. So there's an actual kind of uh, equation here. Uh, what is it here? Even slight misalignment can put a lot of strain on your body. For every inch your head moves in front of your body, 10 pounds of pressure is added to your shoulders. If, for example, your head is four inches in front of your body when you're looking down at your phone, that's like having a child sitting on your shoulders that whole time. Four inches is nothing. Four inches. You test it out yourself. Either way, I know I've had experiences where I was looking at my phone for too long and then you just feel, you know, that kind of like, ah, Ah, you throw the head back. You try to click the spine back into place because you just feel it. <laughs> yes. Everybody's had that experience. all the time. Everybody's had that experience. <laughs> so I, I think the lesson here is avoid the, the 3.5 hour situation and keep your body moving. Your body's meant to move and, and uh, look at your phone here and there and find some balance. You don't want to end up like Jack. It's a disaster. There he is. He's just hunched. He's just, he's practically licking his keyboard over there. It's gross, in fact. Yeah, Mr. Burns, that's Jack. Exactly. You nailed it, Will. Anyway, that's it for me. Uh, Willie Do, what do you have to say to the people out there? Um, stay safe. Enjoy the Joker. Mm. And, uh, yeah, have a good time. <laughs> Why are you looking at me like that? Is that all you got? Yeah. All right. I love it.